Hey everybody, I wanted to give you guys a heads up. We're recording this session on a 360 camera right here. I'm going to be demoing over there, so please don't knock this over. I, I will find you. I will record you. I will find out who it is. Um, but if you don't want to be on camera and just sit like to the side, you'll appear like an ant in the background. But I want to give you guys a heads up. Awesome. Hey, thanks very much. Um, and Jimmy, where are you? Right here. Hey, oh Jesus! Thanks, uh, thanks so much for having us, and excited to kind of kick off your uh, your weekend here with uh, with the first panel of Sports Tech. Um, so, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Marjorie Metre, uh, investment director at Intel Capital. Uh, we have our uh, our panel of esteemed uh, entrepreneurs and execs in the sports uh, sports tech space here, which we'll get into in a second. Um, just so we can calibrate the panel real quick, how many people here are uh, founders of companies? Panelists aside, we got one here. Okay, how many people here are investors? I saw Byron running around. Okay, and uh, how, who's just posing and trying to get out of the heat? Uh, all right, there we go. Perfect, perfect. All right, and the heckler here. Um, so, just a quick thing on Intel Capital. Uh, we are a, a technology VC, um, stage agnostic. Uh, we invest globally. Uh, Forty investors uh, around the world. Uh, and we are, uh, we like to lead, take active uh, roles in building companies, uh, and uh, have started a vertical that includes sports as one of the investment areas, which we're really excited about. That goes hand in hand with the sports business group that we started about a year and a half ago. You might have seen some of the uh, technologies turn up in the Olympics with the Intel TrueView or immersive uh, VR uh, experiences on, on the NBC Sports app. Uh, or at the Super Bowl or, or uh, the NBA game, so uh, we're excited about that. More exciting is the panelists and, uh, and what we have to talk about today, so let's do this. I'd like to uh, each of you to give us a one to two minute overview of your company and what you guys are doing and what is what you feel is disruptive about your technology, your platform, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll kick it off that way with you, Adam. That's good. And you need a mic? Get a mic. Perfect. Thanks, Arjun. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today. My name is Anna Hu. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Breezy. Uh, we make fan-controlled cameras uh, for the sports industry to help them understand, better understand who's actually sitting in their seats uh, and to boost in arena engagement. Uh, we are uh, fortunate enough to work, uh, have our work uh, set up in seven countries so far uh, with customers uh, within the NBA, uh, Grand Slam Tennis, and European Soccer, uh, and hopefully more uh, as, as time goes on. Um, and then, really, the experience, super simple. Uh, you're at a game, pull out your phone, you can punch in your seat, uh, you just go to a mobile website, it's a brand new website, punch in your seat number, and one of our cameras from under the Jumbotron will swivel and find you, you see yourself on your phone, uh, then you have 30 seconds to control that camera, frame the perfect shot, get all your friends in there, snap the photo, the photo's branded and free for you to show on social media. That's it. Go ahead, Doug. Oh, we have uh, audio on Doug's mic. Okay. Hi, my name is Doug. I'm the founder and CEO of Influx. Uh, we are backed by Y Combinator. What we do is we uh, prevent injuries on elite athletes and as well as in the future workplace laborers. Um, our unique value proposition here is we basically marry proven research and marry it to a practical motion capture system that can work anywhere and for the first time uh, is very cost effective. So basically how it works is that uh, we apply these proven research methods um, and can get uh, risk assessment in a matter of minutes per athletes and that enables the sports teams to save millions of dollars, keep their athletes healthy and in the game. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit about me and happy to, and I'm also wearing it now and you know, streaming live and I can shoot a little bit full demonstration. So while most of the other panelists are focused on fan engagement, you're there to keep the athletes healthy yeah. so they, they can yeah, engage the fans. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's brilliant. Natasha. Um, hi everyone, my name is Natasha French. I'm the CMO of Intana. We've created an interactive hologram experience, so we're an AR company, and we believe in the group experience. So fans can don't have to put headsets on, don't have to have wearables, but they can co-create content with their favorite athlete. Best example is we have displays that allow you to stand there, see yourself in real time as a hologram, 
you put your hand in a fist, tennis ball appears, you can serve virtually to Roger Federer, he hits it right back to you. Uh, we work with a lot of brands, so for example, that example was with Mercedes Benz. Usually if you tried to throw a tennis ball at Roger at the US Open, you'd probably get arrested, so we allow you to do that. Where 8,000 fans got to experience that and then share it on social. So the biggest point of our technology is the data. So after you get you do the experience, you can share that on social, and then we take it one step further and we add uh, with facial recognition can um, analyze all the users, so age range, sentiment, and gender. So really allowing brands to understand their customer, but also allowing the fans to create the content with the brand. Shaka. Hi everyone. Nice to be here in uh, sunny Austin from uh, freezing New York. Um, my name is Shaka from WC Sports, uh, we're an Israeli-based company. We've developed a technology that, that allows sports rights owners to automate the creation of content and do it at scale without compromising quality. Basically, uh, we use AI to identify each and every play of the game and create an individual clip for it. So if you have hundreds of plays for each game, a dunk, a steal, a fumble, etc. Uh, we do it across various sports and not only create a clip for every play, we associate the metadata and the information about it and give it a rating score between one and five stars at the scale. That's all automatic and in real time. On top of that, uh, our technology can take all these individual clips and contextually, by the context of the game, by the importance of the play, by the preference of the client, build you video packages, video highlights. So you have endless amount of per permutations to take all those clips and put them together to however highlight you would want. Uh, we also give uh, automatic distribution capability across digital, the digital realm to reach uh, different markets and different uh, digital platforms, all social media and everything, and to target the fan preferences. So uh, this really allows our clients that are the big players, the, the rights owners, the, the NBAs, NFLs of the world, there's only one of each, NBA, NFL, MLS, USTA, all those, they can create all that content and target it to the fan preference. And that really generated, uh, only in 2017, tens of billions of, of views, uh, that's a B, billions. So, uh, oh, forgive me, Shaka, I was just gonna ask you, it's a burning question I've had for a very long time, why are there so many, brilliant Israeli sports tech startups. I mean, we're, we're an investor in WSC, also an investor in ScoreStream. Um, any uh, insight, is it in the, uh, in, in the water, or what, what is it? Um, Israeli mentality is a go-getter mentality. Um, uh, it has its ups and downs, but basically Israelis want more. Uh, they're not content, and so that's the downside as well, but generally they have a drive to, to go forward. And also the experience from uh, military from a young age, positions of leadership, positions of uh, you know real time dilemmas and all that, that that really shapes the character of a person. And you see that so many of the Israeli tech companies, not only in sports but in any realm, they are not generated, but they they have a relation to something from the military. Either the connections made. So two of our, our founders. The, uh, three of them, they met in the military, right? They're from across the country. And that's they met that, and they built the, the, that up together. So that's a legit answer. I appreciate that. I thought you were going to say it was in the water, but <laughs> well, also it's in the water. <laughs> Derek. Hi, I'm Derek. I'm uh, one of the founders and the CEO of ScoreStream. Um, ScoreStream is a crowdsourcing platform, so not unlike the Israeli company Waze, which did crowdsourcing for traffic, we took that same approach for local sports. And so right now, um, on a real-time basis each week, we're crowdsourcing between 10,000 and 15,000 high school or other local sporting events with scores, photos, videos, and chat. So whatever high school you went to in the last 20 years, if you download my app right now, you'll actually see scores from this week. Um, all those scores and data and media, we actually syndicate out to a whole bunch of partners. So we work with every TV station group in the country, most of the radio station groups. We have a deal with the Associated Press where if you submit scores on ScoreStream, they go into your paper the next day. And we also have a really cool uh, partnership with Snapchat where on Friday nights across the country for about 5,000 games, if you're within 500 meters of the 50 yard line of a football game and you take a snap, one of the filters will be the score of that game in time, right then and there. Um, 
in addition to having Intel, we have investors like Verizon, Sinclair Broadcasting, the founder of Under Armour, and like eight strategic Gold. So super excited to be here. I'm from San Diego for 10 person company. Brilliant. Um, so let's start it, uh, with Anna. Just give us a little bit of a flavor of how you're leveraging AI in your platform, your company, and then a little bit about the specific value that it's delivering at the end of the day. We love, we love talking about AI and, and these different these other frontier, cool frontier tech uh, uh, capabilities, but how, are, how is it delivering value to your customer and to your fan at the end of the day? Oh, sorry. Don't worry, we'll do the mic thing <laughs> all hour. Um, so what's really interesting about our application of some of these frontier technologies, we'd say uh, from AR to AI, um, is that uh, our technology is set in a pretty uh, controlled environment. So all of our users are in that arena setting. So now we have this, um, uh, this, this opportunity to augment that environment in a way that's super, super um, just consistent, easy to engage the fan. Um, so think about you know the the way that uh, you, so you see yourself on your phone. Now, how do we apply a layer of mixed reality to that? Um, are you sitting beside your favorite player? Are you um, applying face paint to the people around you before you uh, before you take that photo? Uh, right now, we have you stick out your hand, uh, a spinning basketball uh, appears on your finger. Um, so just all sorts of ways to to augment that experience in real time and give people in the arena an experience that they can't do elsewhere. Because everyone knows that that in arena experience is under attack right now. We need to really compete against all other enter entertainment mediums, the couch, you name it. And uh, to keep people engaged in those seats is one of the most key uh, problems that the entire industry is looking to solve. Awesome. Doug? Um, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, so we're using a lot of data um, to be able to aggregate and understand how different players can get injured. Um, and I think uh, AI can play a huge role in terms of helping us uh, compute and determine um, different training routines for individual players. And I think that as, as it relates to uh, making sure that you know, the athletes can, you know, are, are staying on the field, I think that becomes um, really a game changer. And uh, it's really all about, all about data aggregation. So, so how about prediction? Can you, uh, you leverage AI to predict if an athlete might uh, and you know, be prone to a particular injury or something like that? Yeah, I think the, yes. And I think having a good data set is important to having that predictive analysis. Um, and I think that's where NFLUX can come in and uh, play a large role in that. Awesome. Natasha? I'm back. Um, so twofold. I'll start with the brands in terms of you know why is it good to them. What we're building for them is a 360 degree marketing automation system. So you know all these brands are sponsoring teams in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. However, they don't know who's coming through those doors. They don't get access to StubHub and Ticketmaster. And so before, remember the person with the clipboard asking if you want to sign up for Visa and get a free T-shirt. You know people don't talk to them anymore. So what we've done is we've thrown in our technology. Best example is with Lexus. We started for one month in the Lexus Courtside Club for Clippers. So these are fans who literally have feet on the ground. Um, so probably don't want to be bothered much and just kind of there for the game and have drinks with their buddies. Well, Lexus has doubled their qualified leads using our technology. So in order to use the technology, you walk in, you put your name, email. Lexus also asks for the zip code. After the experience, you actually get to spin a basketball on your finger or dribble it. So it's a gamified experience where we have a leaderboard. Um, so you can still hold that beer in your hand and spin that basketball with your right hand and still enjoy the experience with your friend. We also have another experience where you can build your dream car. So after the game, Lexus now has the name of you know Tom in his between 40 and 45. He preferred the blue car because with sentiment analysis, we can let them know how they responded to the different colors of the car. Um, so for the brand, it's become very valuable. Well, this year, we're really excited. We're now in 12 stadiums with them. And we're actually adding another component, integrating with their CRM system, where now we'll know if you're a Lexus owner. And so there'll be a little special token that appears when you do the experience. Um, so really letting them know we care about you. And it's all about that personalization. 
And for the fan, just kind of on the side of what's the value add is, you know, fans go in and they don't want to just be at the game anymore. They want to do things, be a part of the experience. They trust the brands that are giving them these experiences. So this is allowing them to really feel a part after you do the game. You now get a picture of you on the Clippers court side, you know, as if you're playing basketball and you can share it on your friends. And then additionally, we just launched an AI hologram. So actually, it could be a player. And the player can talk to you, answer questions, and respond back. So for the fan, we're just personalizing that game even more. So a question for you, and then uh, once we get on the panel, also applies to, I think, your business as well. But when you talk to a brand and, and your customers, do they vet or diligence the technology? Do they care there's AI in the stack? Or do they, uh, or other forms of uh, data analytics, or do they just care about the results? Just curious. You no, know, it's actually interesting. So a lot of our brands, they first come to us first for social sharing, because they wanted to share it and track that. And then the others come for us for leads, right? But now they realize I can get the leads, but then also get social content, and then also get responses and how people are responding to our product. So when they, most of the customers come to us for four things. The wow factor, so let's do a hologram. You know, we did a hologram with Nike where literally we put it in the Dallas Stars, um, their new training facility, and holograms of Nike players came out of the ground, and these were the high school kids' uniforms. So that's the wow. The second is the lead gen, so the brands do that, but now they know they can do the social, and now that we have the AI and they can respond. So the cool thing about what we've noticed is they come in for one thing, and then they now get excited, so we're just creating different types of content so they can utilize all the other parts of our technology. Great, thanks. And actually, Anna, while we're on that question, uh, can you comment? There you go. There, there's more of yours. Yeah. <laughs> so we can have a conversation. Fantastic. Uh, no, so, uh, so, the, so the question was, how, how do our customers vet the technology? Yeah, do they, how deep buy? do they go, or are they just looking for the results? I mean, do, do they have people on their staff that can say, hey, look, you know, this, this is legit or, or, or not? Totally. Um, so a lot of our work is with sports organizations directly because we're a revenue generator for them. Um, the, the really interesting thing that we found when it comes to customer acquisition is that we find our next customer on the site of our existing customer. So, um, the, for example, the Australian Open, their head of um, fan engagement was sitting at a Portland Trailblazers game. Um, he was he, like in Portland visiting his family all the way from Melbourne, Australia. And then that's how I, he filled out our contact form on our website and then he just con so they get to experience it firsthand as the fan and all of a sudden we create this ripple effect of um, people that have used the technology they get it right away um, and then so we're able to deploy the same thing in, uh, in, in a time of the Great, thank you. Shaka. Going back to the AI, how it's utilized. Yeah. So AI and the value that it's delivering your customers. Yeah. Sure. So AI is thrown around pretty, uh, you know, <laughs> all the time, pretty much. Uh, but I think it's cool to think about it that those are algorithms and, and methods that were developed in the 40s, right? But we're never, uh, we were never able to utilize them. Now, in the last few years, with all the data and all the computational power, we are able to, to utilize those neural networks. That's the that's the what what we're using mostly. We we use it for the video identification to identify, video analysis to identify all these plays. So that's one layer. The second layer is how to rate the play. Again, neural networks, a lot of information goes in there. The, set, the third is when we create the highlights, we need the context. We need to, you know, we, we get so much statistics uh, uh, pushed in there for the decision tool, for the system to decide what would uh, construct a good highlight because each game has a different context. Was it was it a close game? Was it a blowout? Was it a uh, playoffs or or the first game of the season? The highlight will look different, right? If there was a player that that scored 63 points, it's going to be different if, uh, uh, if if no player scored many points. So all that context is going in uh, to the neural networks and how to build the highlight. Uh, and of course, the last layer is where it goes and how the fan engage with it. So I, I, I gave four different layers of, of, uh, of AI that we use and uh, helps us. Awesome. And Derek? Yeah, I don't really think of what we do is AI necessarily. Um, you know, for us, it is really trying to take the, the, the body of users or quarterly users and um, 
find different ways of using algorithms to determine truth. So as we all know, the internet is full of trolls, so are smartphone applications. Um, and many times on a, a typical Friday night, we may have a game in um, Ohio or Texas where 100 people are submitting scores at the same time. And so our challenge is, who's telling the truth? Generally speaking, about 80% tell the truth, and about 20% are trolls or liars, or their team's losing, and they're very upset. Um, and so for us, we do a number of things. We use machine learning models to be able to score the confidence of the game. Um, when I mentioned that Snapchat example, we do similar things. We send scores out to live television to about 100 TV stations, and if that score is not right, they get really ticked off, as you can imagine. Um, so we use machine learning algorithms to determine what a score looks like. So a football score, two minutes into a game, can't be 35 to nothing, impossible. And so we do percentage belief of, uh, of what that score could be. We geofence location to know the user's scoring uh, behavior in the past. Uh, we data mine social media. And so one of the challenges of social media, if someone on Twitter says Vikings are beating the Colts, well, you may think if in a pro game that's Minnesota versus Indianapolis, but in a high school game, there are so many teams that are north, south, east, west, central, Washington, Lincoln, Kennedy, and we've built up natural language processing modules to be able to determine when you say this Washington is beating this north, we know it's this particular team at this point in time. Um, and so I think out of that we're doing some fun stuff. I, we, we send photos out, and so we're actually looking, we've hand rated thousands of photos every week, um, and now we're looking at across data sets of about half a million photos and videos, can we apply machine learning to rate those photos for quality and for other things like that. Um, so for us I'd say AI early, but we have a lot of frameworks and massive data sets to be able to play with. That's great. So this one will go to the whole panel. And uh, so we're talking about specific applications of frontier tech in the sports vertical. Um, you guys go deep in that. Uh, and, uh, but there are also companies out there that are building horizontal platforms that are trying to attack different verticals from healthcare to fintech to, to sports tech. Why? Um, Who's going to win at the end of the day? And I know you guys are going to be biased on this, but love to hear why you feel, for instance, um, sports vertical in particular, uh, if you play in that space, you're going to win over someone who's trying to play in a horizontal game. Or maybe you know, if you cohabitate, I don't know. So who wants to take that one? Vertical versus horizontal. All right, I'll, I'll start. All right, so I think sports and entertainment and specifically sports is quite unique uh, in two main ways. There are more, but let's stick with two. One is the end consumer, we call them a fan. That entails loyalty, that entails involvement. Right? It's not uh, your bank client or, uh, I don't know, a healthcare uh, a beneficiary, right? It's, it's someone that has passion, they want to be involved, they want to get more, and they're gonna stay with you even if you suck, the team, right? Uh, so that's one thing, that's very unique. The second thing is that uh, although it's so uh, global, right? Sports is something that connects people across the world, it's still a centralized industry. There are, there's a finite number of, of big players. Uh, I said before, I said the NBAs of the world, there are just one NBA, right? And I think Anna's example from Portland to, to uh, uh, Melbourne was a great example on how tight everything is, a lot of connections, but it's within a small, relatively small community. So, so basically you have that uh, engagement of everyone as fans, but you have to penetrate a very, a very small group of big players and, and the threshold to, to, to penetrate that, to be successful there, I think is quite high and requires expertise. So the vertical uh, approach, I think, is, uh, is required in sports. And you see all of the big companies like Amazon and Facebook, they're uh, an Intel, right? That they're doing their sports uh, um, steps with a specific sports entity within Intel. Uh, because it requires that much expertise and, and dealing with, with the NFL, is there's just one NFL and you have to deal with NFL and see what drives them, what's their incentives. There's, you have to drill down. So basically, vertical is, is important in sports. I don't uh, um, take into account the, the possibility that someone in a broader sense will, will succeed, but uh, I put my money on, on vertical. Brilliant. Anyone else want to take a hack at that? Uh, how about Natasha and Derek? 
Yeah, so we you know, we do work across a lot of different sectors. Uh, we actually started entertainment, quickly realized DJs don't have any money and don't want to pay for anything. It's the brands, and that's when the sports made sense, because they have an active, like you just described, a fan base. You know, they're participatory, and we have a technology that enables that. However, that technology can be used across multiple different verticals where we work a lot. Um, you know, for example, we work with Intel where we telepresence one of your executives to in type, hey, because you couldn't be there, or you guys were launching a chip that was going to power AR and VR. So our technology enabled them to use that. Um, with our AI concierge, it's actually really interesting. We launched for the sports hospitality. First person that called us was a bank. So we're actually currently in the process of developing a hollow teller. Um, for a bank. Um, so the, what we look now at is, you know, we're building our sports division and our technology makes real, a lot of sense there. However, we're also working with manufacturing companies where we can overlay our technology so we can see, they can see how much materials they have before they purchase all these materials and how much more materials they need. So with the software platform that we're enabling other brands besides, sorry, verticals to use, um, where on the sports end, we have to speak of how it makes them work, but we can also work with those other sides. Sports, you'll always have that fan base and you'll always have teams. So I think when, I, when we look at that and who's winning the race, it's where is it most applicable and where does it make most sense? Um, you know, where sports does make sense. However, training is another huge place that we haven't even touched using our technology. Um, and I think that's going to be another big use case, at least for the AR, AR side of it, which you've seen a lot of, especially like in the HoloLens and the Daiquiri helmets and other products that are being made. Um, so I think on the training side, a lot of other verticals, there'll be a lot of growth there as well. So you're, you started in sports, and now you're scaling other verticals, basically. Yeah, to be in Isaac. Great. Yeah, for us, we think that, um, you know, obviously, we, we have looked a lot at other things that are not sports. So we've tried to look at are there opportunities to do this sort of thing we've done in politics and other things. And the reality is sports a bounded problem. A, a sporting event happens at a certain time, it ends at a certain time, there's so many people playing, there's a range of scores. Um, but I think even more important, there's a language, right? So for example, in the you know, FT, what's that? You know, in the United States, that doesn't mean anything. In Europe, that means full time. And so the language around specific sports and all the things you have to do from an analytical perspective to understand the language of a game um, or the interactions of the plays, I think takes a lot of deep expertise. But, but I do think Google wins everything, just to declare. Uh, but I think from an AI perspective, having to get that deep expertise allows you to really go to a very fragmented part of the market. And, and all the relevant training data that goes with it. Absolutely. Anyone else want to weigh in? Uh, Dada, please. Yes. So I think um, for startups, uh, I think a vertical approach is much better. And I think um, the reason why I think that is because when you are in a startup, you have limited resources. And I think a horizontal play um, kind of spreads yourself a little bit more thin. Um, and you have to make one happy user first. Um, or First, make one happy user, then scale on from there. Um, I think with the horizontal You've been pitching VCs lately. Yeah. Be <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think uh, with with a horizontal play, um, you have less control over the user experience, and I think that you you're better off um, being a master of one uh, than than none. And uh, I think like really just closing closing the the gap is that. Um, in order to go to other verticals or perhaps going to a horizontal, um, because that does have a lot of advantages for sure, it's uh, it's all about building the credibility and uh, and scaling scaling from there. I'm, I'm a big believer in crossing chasm theory of, uh, of building businesses, and so I think verticals are the way to go. Yeah, one thing if I could add, Arjun, just yeah, the one thing about sports too, I'd say is like, you know, we support 20 sports and we want to add another 30 or 40. And so, I mean, it's not like it's just, I'm just doing football or I'm just doing baseball. I think the, the range of sport and the level of sport from pro to amateur to youth creates a, it's a, it's a big pool to play in. And so I think that's something we you know, also gives us opportunities. Absolutely. Uh, just one uh, interesting uh, point that came to mind when you asked that question is also when it, when it, when it applies to, into sports as an industry, if you look around, the biggest and boldest sports organizations around the world are evolving themselves. They are starting to tap into their product into multiple industries. Um, you know, you look at MSG, like they started um, many different, started acquiring music festivals and different venues. They started acquiring a chains of restaurants. 
right? So what is that about, right? And their, their thesis is, you know, we want to be uh, owning out-of-home entertainment first in North America, maybe eventually the world. And so we're starting to see the thought leaders in this industry uh, understanding that once they've got a, you know, once they've got the depth of knowledge in one uh, type of consumer engagement, that you can now spread it out. So for us as a startup, although absolutely agree, right? We need to be zeroed in on creating that perfect customer experience from the outset. But as our customers evolve and they're trying to reinvent themselves, we get to play, there's an amazing opportunity for us to play in that and we're building out um, unified photo experience solutions for some of our uh, tennis customers that want to cover the entire grounds instead of just the in-seat in arena. They want to turn themselves into a Disney world, right? Like they're trying to think about how to unify those, um, those industries themselves. Great, thank you. So, uh, Jimmy, uh, how much time before we start to cut yeah. the audience? But this is this is a great time. If you uh, want to start now, or we've got one more question for the panel. Yeah, why don't we? If anyone's got a well, yeah, I'll we'll start with the audience question. Yeah. Can you expand on that? Uh, where you're focusing on virtual right across the category. What kind of what kind of read, what kind of reading did you do to like come up with your business strategy? Or resources. Expand on that. Um, expand on my the research I've done, or no? When you're talking about like we're out focusing on vertical, because uh, we're all trying to be innovative. Oh right. And uh, can you repeat the question just so people in the uh, webcast can? Uh, so I believe the question would be: Can you expand upon the research and also your thinking behind your business strategy? Is that, that pretty much correct? Okay. Um, so the research I've done is um, Peter Thiel also has a, a really good book. I forget the name. That's a terrible answer to begin with. But yeah, Peter Thiel is really, zero one, that's a, that's a great book. Uh, Cosmic and Chasm as well, they have a really good framework. Um, if, you, if you're reading the audio book, it's, it's a minute, it's about around the seven to 30 minute mark of uh, chapter 11. Um, and he'll go through an entire framework of uh, how to rate things and, and things like that. Um, so it's, it's a framework. Um, to expand on my business strategy, so what we're doing now is we're focusing on, it's, it's all about reducing scope, but making sure that the uh, customer that we have has a compelling reason why. And I think that's the most important part of making a product. Um, so even if it's a tiny, tiny way or you know, a little market, um, I think it's a better, better thing than trying to you know, launch something that's so broad that you know, it doesn't have that compelling reason why. Um, and that's the common denominator here. So we start with the ACL focusing on the need, really, really super focused on one thing, and those customers tend to be um, NCAA D1 or D3, you know, uh, maybe high, uh, elite high schools um, in, uh, in like football or basketball, and so it's, uh, it's very niche. But what we're doing in their long-term vision is to become um, in, in workplace preventing uh, knee injuries. So we have pilots with UPS, which are, are huge deals, but when you try to scale to other verticals, you have to have a good sense of, you have to have, you have to have uh, created credibility um, and, and the following, because these other bigger players that are more pragmatic, um, they won't give a shit if you're, you know, you, they'll think, you know, sorry, there's tons of startups, they're going to die. Um, and so being able to hone in on that revenue stream that can keep, keep you alive to get those big deals, I think is really important. And I think getting into the mainstream markets, I think that's how you get into that. And I think even with Amazon, they start off with, um, and even eBay, there's a lot of examples, but uh, you know, Amazon or even eBay, they start off with Pez dispensers, I believe. Um, and then we got to where they are, and then Amazon did the same thing with books, and now they're, they buy Whole Foods. So um, I think I think there's a lot of truth in uh, crossing the chasm at zero one. And so I'm so sure about that. Thanks. Do you want to try another? Please, please. Yeah, so for us, I haven't very much a, a similar mindset about that. So for us, we originally did high school sports. That's it. We didn't want to do college or pro. Everyone's doing college and pro. You license that data. Um, and so when we get a, we, when we created a great experience for the high school uh, fans, they started scoring college and pro games. We didn't really want that to happen. Um, and in fact, now that experience is very different. You know, our high school experience is like a news experience. 
uh, you know, we're gonna win the game, Johnny's gonna touchdown, here's a picture, of the video. Our college and pro experience is Reddit. It's memes, it's smack talk, it's crazy. Um, but once we've established a good user experience on the high school side, people wanna use it for other sports. So we do youth, we do college and stuff. And I think that getting really focused on that initial experience and creating that, you know, now this morning we had women's handball in Poland going on and, and that kind of thing. So you have a great framework and then you can reach into new audiences and go from there. Great. Anyone else want to read? Other, other questions in the audience? Otherwise, we'll have a couple more we'll ask the panelists here. Anupam. Hey, I have a question for Sasha. Uh, Shaka. Shaka. So, is the end customer benefit that's being realized, is it along the lines of efficiency uh, versus the traditional method? Or uh, is it around growth? So the question was uh, whether the end uh, upside is efficiency or growth. And uh, although there were two options there, I will say yes and yes and yes. Uh, so, and, and maybe one more yes. So basically, uh, we provide the videos faster. It's, it's real time or near real time, while the game is still alive or after the game. Two is we can create more videos now you can create Omri Kaspi highlights and send it to your partners in Israel, right? Who would have created that? Uh, and you can think of numerous other examples. You know, take the Duke uh, alumni and send them to North Carolina, um, uh, you know, uh, platform, whatever. Uh, so you can, you can create more. You can target. That's that's three already. You can you can have your uh, content content context. Uh, help you target the fans. And um, we, uh, we also give the ability to, uh, to distribute it on more platforms, more uh, digital platforms, because it's all seamless in the automatic process. So the one video that you create really easily, I mean, the system does it for you, but it goes to multiple places at the same time. So you can have 20 different publish points. It's there. So Across all of those, it's more uh, it's more efficient, and we've seen growth. You know, it's uh, uh, orders of magnitude uh, more not only in the amount of content created, but but in views as well, and fan engagement. Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, this question for the whole panel: Like, got good business model, low research. Where are, where are the things in your armor? Like, where are the, where are the things in your armor? What is the compensation, or is the market shortcoming? Like, what are you worried about? The question was about challenges. What are you worried about? Um, so I'll start. It's been interesting. Um, and we've been around almost six years now. And the first part of that was educating the marketplace. So, you know, you have this sexy, wow technology, but what does it actually do? And so, first time when we were going out to market, it was like we're selling these products. You can get a life size, you can get a small one, it can fit here, but we quickly realized we're actually providing solutions. And those solutions are experiences. So instead of selling that life size where you can see a tennis player, it's, you know, we can increase your social by creating an experience where people are gonna wanna share this. Or, you know, we can put a car into a stadium because you actually can't, Lexus versus Kano, so they couldn't fit a car in the stadium. But we sold that as lead generation. And so I think that initial thing of educating the marketplace, I say this year is the year of the hologram and AR because people are getting it and they're seeing these applications, but it was, you know, we've redone our website, I think we're on our fourth version, but you know, this version, people, we get it. We see your solutions and I think that's been something that's been exciting and helpful for us is being very specific. And also I think kind of going back to that vertical question is, we now have these use cases in those different verticals, and it's now very easy for people to understand and apply it to themselves. So I think how we sold it has been a very like a game changer for us, and how people are understanding our model now. What kind of customer leads are you doing? Well, it depends on kind of. It's basically one thing we have done. Um, we just started Google AdWords last uh, month, so a lot of our technology sales have been through word of mouth at the moment, um, which has been huge for us, as well as presence at different, um, where we're now just implementing those um, kind of 
in our marketing plan, implementing all of that now, um, kind of based on our company. We just hired our first full-time salesperson. Um, our CEO and myself have been doing all the sales um, from the past few years. And so we've been just starting all of that at the moment. Um, then, uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. So, uh, I think uh, keeps you up at night. Check in the armor. Yeah. So I think it's a great question, and I think the first thing a company needs is to keep asking that question. Because, for example, with us, we've been ahead of the curve uh, for for a few years now, and we just one of the concerns is to keep asking that question. Because if you don't, you get complicit, you get indifferent, and someone really uh, you know, passes you by without you noticing. And I think it relates to the first questions that the question asked there. Uh, you always need to, when you do your research, you always need to be ready to pivot and ready. Uh, I know it's a buzzword, but uh, but it's but it's real. You always need to to uh, ask yourself, where is the curve and where am I? Um, and uh, our technology for a few years has been, you know imaginary for, for people that see it for the first time, but I think by now it's uh, it makes more sense to people than it used to be. I mean, they're, they're used to seeing stuff that are not, not as good, but similar. Uh, so we can't have the competition catch up to us because we want to be innovative with the next step. And we've had, we've had many ideas uh, throughout the years and keep doing more and improving. Um, and uh, the second point, or, or relates to that, is that we are trying as much as we can to take a breadth approach in the vertical, right? So we try to touch as many sports and be uh, sports types. We have 10 now and developing more all the time. Uh, to be with more big players, to have them more dependent on the technology because once you go there, you can't go back when you create 5,000 videos a night, you can't go back to creating 40, you can't. So we want to be there, and, and and once we're there, then all our funky ideas are coming in, and every year we're doing more with every client. So basically the first year is just, just so, show us this works. When it works, the next year is a whole different thing. They're doing so much more with, with us and utilizing the technology so much more. So we're trying to, Get as uh, much as much footprint as we can, and then march forward with every point. Great, Jimmy. How are we doing on time? We're great. So more questions for the fire and rapid. One more question. Can, can I get that one too, real quick? Just yeah, one, please. please. Mobile growth. You know, so we're a mobile application primarily, and growth in mobile is very difficult. It's it's um, the app store construct of two different app stores with two million apps. You can only get so many downloads a day with over so many effects. And so for us, you know, we've tried TV ads, radio ads, social, you, you name it, and and we know what the maximum capacity is for a cost of acquisition under 25 cents or so, and there's just a cap to that. And so we have to look at organic growth, and that doesn't, you know, that's not fast enough. So, you know, so that is certainly the thing we think about the most. It's growth. How do you how do you continue to grow in a market constrained by two app stores? I think Anna, you're going to pile in. Well, it's actually great uh, for me to add on to uh, that point. There is um, think about so there's a lot of challenge. Are you asking because you're an entrepreneur? Yeah. <laughs> you, you get that title once you make the money. <laughs> well, no, it's, it, there's, there's, the, there's also that for taking the risk. But um, so there's a lot you learn along the entrepreneurial journey, of course, and we've sorted out a lot of problems. But then also I think there's a common stage that all entrepreneurs reach when they found product market fit, when their product is in production, and it really is able, if you, uh, you understand what it takes to scale. Um, and then it's about the velocity and acceleration. Um, and so for us, and this is a personal question for me because it's, um, you know, we've gotten ourselves to an incredibly, um, a point that we're really proud of as a team. And then um, you look around and sports tech is still very much a nascent industry in the way that it's uh, funded. The, the, the um, venture capitalists that are looking at this, um, most of them don't have yet have a really strong grasp of the industry as much as, you know, things like FinTech and, and and any of those other um, industries that it's easy to work in and then have a venture capital mindset about it. There's, there's that kind of tie-in. So um, so for us, like I, I look forward to that um, 
that market growing um, for us to find the right capital partners to help us extend globally, right? Like, you know, we should have sales forces in those seven countries, but we don't. But it was right. So it's, it, it's that, right? And every entrepreneur needs to be thinking about, okay, when am I going to reach that point, and how do I make sure that I've built the right relationships so that by then I, I know who to call to help me um, help to help me scale my business to the next level. Great. So maybe let's move to close then and uh, go down the line here. Um, so let's flip it around. Uh, without letting the cat out of the bag, you know, what are you guys most excited about in the next two or three years? And you can't say a, an exit, um, but uh, you know, basically, you know, from a technology perspective, from a commercial perspective. I mean, we all know. In, in the U.S., certainly, a lot of the rights uh, for some of the major leagues are all up for grabs again, and we're seeing the likes of the Amazon, the Facebooks turn up and bidding big, big money to uh, to get in the game, literally. Um, what are you excited about for uh, for your business in particular? And then one minute answers. Yeah. Um, a couple things. So um, I think uh, was, we were just at CES, and um, you know, one of the things that we're most excited about is when 5G becomes accessible, right? Uh, when that when that technology becomes widespread, there's going to be an entire new generation of fan experiences that were never possible before. Um, you know, there's just so many different applications of that. Um, and but but zeroing in on that a little bit more is that right now we're seeing kind of two categories of fan engagement, either really scalable but but um, kind of on the low side of engagement rates uh, versus really highly engaging stuff, but it's really hard to scale. And so I think in the next two, three years, we'll be able to now like really zero in and th those technologies that are highly scalable and high, uh, they reach a lot of people, they're highly engaging are the ones that are going to proliferate. I'm excited to see, uh, see that. Great, thank you. Doug? Um, the thing I'm most excited about is, is data and collecting that and aggregating a lot of that, because I think it provides a lot of insights and um, I didn't answer it. I didn't talk about like what is you know some of my the armor question. Uh, but startups are, are just generally pretty hard to begin with. Uh, I think Elon Musk said it, that that like a, a startup is like uh, chewing on glass, <laughs> and so pretty much everything keeps you up at night from products to sensor accuracy to the user experience to. But, but what are you most excited about? That? Well, I'm, I'm most excited about, about getting the products um, to the point where, yeah, to, to the point where um, the user experience is just so easy to use that um, that everyone can. We have made a lot of great progress, but um, sensor accuracy and, and presentation of the data so that it's really easy for a lot of people to digest, um, I think, is is a really major part, and uh, that's what I'm really most excited about. Great, thank you. Natasha. Yeah, there's two things we're really excited about this year and the years to come. Is the first, we're actually going to be opening up our platform this year, so people can upload their own content. So I think that's there's so many people creating AR content, and you know we're going to be opening it up, and we're excited to see what people create and who, what we can create with them on that, and also make there's a lot of agencies that work with brands, and so it's giving them a chance. You know, why reinvent the wheel? And so we have our hologram best practices and our AR platform to enable people to do that. Um, that will be coming up towards the end of the year. And the second is we're display agnostic. Um, so which is even more exciting where you know, we're building the software and platform. So we have actually VR companies coming to us that don't have a social sharing component. So now they can actually add our social sharing piece. So after you do that VR experience, you get a takeaway seeing yourself in that environment. So I think that's going to be exciting to be able to now work with other brands and create new content. Fabulous. So if I, you, you open up the API uh, platform, uh, I can have a life-size Rick hack in my living room, for instance. Every so day. We all, we all <laughs> Rick runs our media and entertainment business down in LA, and I was trying to think of a game box joke, but that just didn't happen. So I'm sorry. <laughs> Shaka. All right. So uh, in the coming few years, I see two trends that will come to fruition. The first is we moved from globalized content, whatever ESPN had to offer, to localized content. What you have on the NBA US is not what you have on NBA Brazil or NBA Australia, etc. And now we're moving to personalized content. What Derek wants, uh, Natasha's fantasy team, recap, right? 
all that, all of those, that's personalized content. That's the sec that's the first trend. Uh, and imagine a future where where billions of videos are created each day and sent to each of you that are unique with your name on there and, and what you bought yesterday, maybe you want to buy a compliment product and you can share it and trash talk whoever you beat on the fantasy uh, game yesterday, right, or today. So that's one trend from globalized to localized to personalized. The second trend, uh, as I see it, is from video whenever there was available, right, whenever it was on TV. We went to VOD, video on demand. Now we can take it whenever we want. But now I argue that we're going to VOC, video on command. I want to control my experience with the video, not only when I want it, but how I want it. Not only the content, I want to click through the, the plays to see it faster. Whoever uses stories know this, knows this, or uses YouTube with a double tap to get 10 seconds forward. That's so the same video will have different experiences for, for different fans. So from VOD to VOC, I think, is a big trend that will, that will uh, get bigger. And we're, uh, we're trying to, to be there and tap that really early and, and be a driving force in that as well. So if I want to see every fumble the Gamecocks have made in the last 10 years and post it on Rick's uh, Facebook page, we'll be able to do that. Yes. All right, I got one in. I'm sorry, man. Right. I'm most excited about the rise of new platforms as legitimate platforms. So I have um, a 15-year-old and 13-year-old triplets, and they don't care what's on TV. They watch stuff on their phone. They watch Twitch. They watch YouTube. Um, I think in sports, things like you know Pluto to some extent, but Flow. And I think that as more channels open up and become legitimate, accepted as a platform, there's more opportunities for all of our content to go to those places. And I think that's that's just getting better and better each day. And I think that's a great opportunity for all of us. What a great way to end the panel. So uh, put your hands together and thank our uh, panel.